Hello, welcome back to another episode of the African Fireside Podcast. Um, it's been a, a long week, a week full of uh, African World Cup qualifiers, so we've mostly been focused on covering that uh, on the podcast, but now we're back to the Five Aside Podcast instead of the African Football Roundup. This is the episode where it's a little better researched, it's more historical, and uh during this first match day, we're looking at profiling five African heads of state and their relationship with football and how they used football as a political means to further their agendas. Uh, in the first episode, we looked at the Egyptian uh, president, Gamal Abdel Nasser. In the second episode, we looked at the Ghanaian president, Kwame Nkrumah. And now we're looking at the Congolese president, Joseph Desiree Mobutu, later known as Mobutu Sese Seko. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump right into it. So we're going to begin with a little bio of Mobutu. Um, I mean, there's not too much that's written about him as a young child. We knew that he grew up in a modest family. His father died when he was young. Um, he was sort of adopted uh, or raised by his uncle and his and his grandparents. Um, and his father, former father, was a cook for a Belgian judge. And even that family sort of took him under his wing, taught him how to read and write in French. Um, and he actually did quite well in school. Um, he was described as intelligent, impish, uh, funny, but also kind of indisciplined. Um, and it got to the point where he actually escaped from school at one point and was punished. I guess at the time, punishment was prison uh, in these missionary schools, but he was actually sent to the army instead of going to prison, um, and that's where he st first got his military education. In the military, he had access to a lot of literature. Uh, he's described as having read Charles de Gaulle, uh, Winston Churchill, and Niccolò Machiavelli. That's sort of like, if you think about like, oh, a political leader that's going to be kind of manipulative. I mean, those are the three names that you would think of, right? Um, so as he's reading, he becomes more and more interested. Uh, he becomes a journalist. He attends the 1958 World Expo. Um, and that's where he meets other Congolese intellectuals, people like Patrice Lumumba. Um, and he becomes quite close to them. He actually becomes Patrice Lumumba's assistant, personal secretary, he's described as. Um, and after independence, he sort of is given this military role, um, military leadership role. And the post-independent Congo is very, very complicated. I think you would need like five or six episodes to describe what happened in and of themselves. Um, but what you kind of have to know is that there's a lot of fractures, a lot of uh, betrayals, but what, for the purposes of this podcast, we're not going to get into all of that. All you have to really know is that Mobutu consolidates power, seizes power, I should say, in 1965. Um, and the context is that, you know, colonization was horrible, evil all over Africa, but Congo Kinshasa at the time, it's probably the worst. I mean, to this day, it remains, the country remains one of the richest in terms of primary unrefined resources, things, you know, like copper and, and cobalt and, and all these extremely rare and expensive minerals. Um, and it was always sort of exploited directly. People were not really being educated or they had re been refused access to education. And that was the context that he took power uh, in and Unfortunately, uh, you know, this fight for these resources continues until this day. But 1965, Mobutu uh, rises to power, and that's going to be it for the bio. Now we're going to get into his relationship with football. So the Congo actually have a quite, I'm not going to say a healthy football scene, but they had people that were trying to develop sport uh, even during the colonial period. And... The most famous name is Tata Raphael. Tata Raphael is a missionary, a Belgian man, uh, an aristocrat, I think. He's kind of rich. His family has money. But he is a person that takes this money, goes to, at the time, what was called the Belgian Congo, and 
really invest himself and invest his money into developing sport as a tool for education and maybe even religion. Um, there's this doctrine of muscular Christianity that Dr. Peter Alleggi talks about and brings up um, where, you know, a lot of Christian missionary schools or, or, or Christian leaders saw this as an opportunity to use sport to really, uh, what they would say, teach uh, indigenous peoples about higher values because they think sport brings higher values. Um, it seems like Tata Raphael did that, but it seems like Tata Raphael was also somebody that was very much appreciated by the Congolese people. I think they understood that he was somebody that really was investing himself, that wasn't really interested in, in domination, but more in, in helping people. Um, and actually, when he passes away, they bring his remains back to Congo, and, and he's buried in Congo, and and there's up to 100,000 people for his funeral. So just wanted to explain about Tata Raphael and different people in the Congo at the time that were developing sport, where maybe it wasn't as developed elsewhere on the continent. I told you about the post-independent mess, post-independence mess really in the Congo, um, about this power struggle. And Europe takes complete advantage of this, especially Belgian football clubs. Um, it's estimated that up to 25 players left the Congo and went to get go play football in Belgium between 1961 and 1963 um, under the argument that there was actually no FIFA recognized group or federation at the time. So they said, hey, we can't play our football here. I guess we're allowed to go play in Europe. Um, and these group of players, these 25, they end up known, they're known later on as the les Belgicains, so the Belgian Africans. Uh, and there were some really, really great players. Um, the most famous, perhaps, is Paul Bonga Bonga. He's um, the first African to be included in World Soccer Magazine's Team of the Year uh, in 1962. Another one is Julien Kialunda, um, who's known as Puskas, even though he's a defender. I think it's because during his time at Anderlecht, you know, they played against Real Madrid and, and he played Puskas really, really well. So you have these pretty great players that are playing, you know, Anderlecht in the 1960s was a great club and they were playing, going quite far in the equivalent of the European Champions League. Um, so you have these really great players, but like, again, for the Congolese economy and primary resource materials, they're being extracted, sent over there with very little benefit to the national team. And so the national team starts playing, at the time they're called the Congo Kinshasa Lions. Um, and they're struggling, really. And there's one match in particular that is a turning point for the national team and for the history of football in the Congo. This match happens on May 20th, 1966. And Mobutu is in the stadium. Uh, so he's in the stadium to watch a match between Congo versus Ghana. And if you don't know anything about Ghana in the 60s, we talked about it during the Kwame Nkrumah episode. But basically, from 63 to 65, they won the two African Cup of Nations tournaments, and they were fly, very far advanced compared to the rest of the, the national teams on the continent. Um, they were just so good, and uh, whether it's at the club level or at the national team level, the Black Stars were the premier team on the, on, the, on the continent. So in this match on May 20th, 1966, Congo loses 3-0 in front of Mobutu, but they don't just lose 3-0, they're, they're humiliated. <laughs> I mean, there is a testimony of Ghanaian players taking the time to stop the ball, juggle. Uh, apparently, some players would, like, run up to the president's box and, like, feign an army salute in direction of Mobutu uh, to sort of ridicule <laughs> the, the leadership at the time. Uh, Really, people really felt humiliated by that loss. It wasn't just a normal 3-0 drubbing. And this was not unusual for Ghanaian players. There's a, a very famous Ghanaian goalkeeper, Robert Mensa, in the 60s, apparently, that used to, you know, if his club were winning matches and the, defense, the opposing team were not really attacking his goal, he would pick up a newspaper and pretend to read it. So they were like showboaters extraordinaire. So, I mean, understandably, Mobutu is furious. And he decides there and then that Congo Kinshasa are going to be a really good national team. And the first thing that he does is he imposes this authorization to leave the country. So no longer are we having 25 players just leaving and going to go play for Belgian clubs. And this is actually a, a law that becomes quite widespread on the African continent for the next two or three decades. 
players usually won't be able to leave Africa um, until they're the age of like 26 or 28 unless they have presidential authorization. And this is a sort of seen as a law that's instituted so that domestic football can thrive. So Mobutu imposes this, this law in 66. And the second thing he does is he recalls all of the les Belgica, the Belgian Africans, and he tells them, hey, you have to come back to, to the Congo. Uh, of the 25, almost two dozen come back. Um, and they are integrated into the national team. But the first games are a little loose. They're lacking team chemistry. And for that first year, that 1966 year, we don't see a great difference in the results, even though people uh, and, and newspapers and journalists write that the players have improved by far. There just seems to be like a lack of cohesion. And so they hire in 67 Lyon Mokuna Troué, who is actually a protege of, of Tata Raphael, uh, one of the first Congolese players to ever go play in Europe. And Mobutu also decides that we need a rebrand. You know, We can't just keep playing as the Lions of Congo Kinshasa that got smacked by Ghana 3-0. We need a rebrand. And so in 1967, Congo Kinshasa changes the name of the national team from the Lions to the Leopards. And to this day, they're still called the Leopards. Now, why the Leopards? The Leopards, if you ever see a picture or a video of Mobutu, you'll, you'll notice, especially uh, after he assumed the presidency and, and later on in his life, he's wearing a hat. And the hat is made of, uh, you know, there's a leopard print. It's not made of leopard skin, but there's a leopard print on his hat. Um, and with the first game, with the new name, the Congo Kinshasa Leopards, they play against that very same Ghana national team in 1967, and they beat them 2-0. So you see, there's already a switch in mentality. There's already a change in results. And now they're rolling. I mean, Santos FC is doing a, a, a tour of the African continent. Pele comes through and they only lose 2-1 uh, to that team. Um, and they qualify for the 1968 African Cup of Nations. And they're getting good results and good results. And they make it to the final. And who do they meet in the final? Ghana. You guessed it, Ghana. Um, they beat their arch rivals. And this has now become the premier rivalry in African football. But they beat them in the 68 AFCON final and they become African champions just in two years. In two years, Mobutu's investment in football makes Congo Kinshasa uh, African champions. Uh, they all receive the order of merit from Mobutu when they go home. It, the scenes at the time are described as nonstop partying and it whets their appetite for more success. And really what we're going to see is that the next five to six years of Congolese football. This is the golden age. Even clubs like TP Mazembe, which were called TP Engelbert at the time, uh, they win you know, the first treble in African football, League Cup and, and Champions League. Uh, and it, they continue their success. In 1970, this is a little bit of an outlier. They're eliminated in the group stages of the AFCON, but they had a very tough group. They had Guinea, who, again, if you know anything about Guinea in the 70s, great side. Ghana, who we talked about, their arch rivals, and, and Egypt, who uh, are back in the AFCON after uh, after boycotting the 1965 edition and then withdrawing from 1967 edition because of their war against Israel. And you could learn about all of that if you go back to listen to the Gamal Abdel Nasser episode uh, that we did on this very same channel. In 1971, uh, Congo Kinshasa changes its name to Zaire. Uh, this is a product of one of Mobutu's uh, tenets. It's, it's the authenticité doctrine. Authenticité is like a return to our authentic roots, not the European colonial uh, roots or not the European colonial uh, imposition of you know cultural values and whatever the case may be. So even the hat that I was talking about, the, the leopard hat that Mobutu wears, that's called an abacost. Abacost is, you know, they blend abba le costume in French which means down with the suits. Uh, at the time, I guess, Congolese people were no longer allowed to wear suits and European wear. Rather, they were supposed to wear, you know, traditional uh, attire. Uh, and it's a doctrine that I think would speak very well to me. I'm somebody that very rarely wears suits in general. So um, so they would change the way they dress, change the way, th even their names. So Mobutu went from Joseph Desiré Mobutu to Mobutu Sese Seko. Uh, they changed the name of the country. They changed the currency. And you see this, I mean, presumably what this is supposed to be is, is supposedly is, uh, you know, an awakening of sorts. Um, 
So everything everywhere changes. And in 72, Zaire are a little bit unlucky in the AFCON. They're eliminated by Mali in the semifinals. Um, this is the Mali of Salif Keita, one of Africa's greatest ever players, Fanta Madi Keita as well. And around this time as well, we start seeing uh, Copper nosedive. So when Mobutu took power in 65, 66, Copper shot up the price of Copper. It went from 30 cents uh, USD to around 70. Um, and now it halves again. So in 73, it goes down. So what we start to see is that as the economy of the country went up, there was heavy investment in the national team. And we're going to see from 73, the investment in the national team is actually going to go down. It's going to take a few years, though. Um, and in the really in the next two years, you have three very, 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 very important events in Congolese sport. Um, so Copper nose dives, Mobutu sort of panics, and what he does is he nationalizes a lot of these companies that existed in Congo. Remember, Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, and that was seen as very, uh, by European powers at least, it was seen as very uh, uh, subversive, very dangerous. Uh, Mobutu does the same thing, but the problem is that he takes these national companies and he gives them to people that are closest to him, and corruption starts to run rampant, and these companies actually become less and less efficient because all of a sudden their leadership is not necessarily qualified to run these companies. But let's get back to the football. Uh, in 1973, uh, Congo Kinshasa, or Zaire, apologies. <laughs> Zaire are playing World Cup qualifying. I've described World Cup qualifying before. Now Africa do have one guaranteed spot after the boycott of 1966, which we talked about in the Kwame Nkrumah episode. But look, look at the qualifying. It's 10 matches. And in the ninth match, the penultimate match, this is the last round against Morocco, who had qualified to the 1970 World Cup and picked up Africa's first point at a World Cup. Zaire hosts Morocco and beats them 3-0. And according to concordant sources, actually, the Moroccans, but also, you know, like the Tunisian journalist Fawzi Mahjoub, who's an authority on African football and, and even other neutral observers, the refereeing in that match was actually very, very suspicious. There was a Ghanaian referee. His name is George Lamptey. He's been accused of maybe being on Mobutu's payroll. I'm not going to go that far. But what I would say is that according to neutral observers, um, this, the, the officiating wasn't up to par. So they lose, they, sorry, Zaire win 3-0 at home. And Morocco refuses to play the return leg. And Zaire are the first, again, I don't like this term, but sub-Saharan African team to make it to the FIFA World Cup, 1974 FIFA World Cup. But before they go to the World Cup, they play the 1974 Africa Cup of Nations in Egypt. Um, 1974 Cup of Nations, they, they, it's not necessarily Les Belgiques anymore. It's not the Belgian Africans and those 20 people, 20 players that came back to the Congo. Now it's a new generation, uh, mostly built from clubs like Ais Vita Club, uh, TP Mezembe now is called Mezembe instead of uh, TP Engelber. Uh, again, that's part of the authenticity and renaming names of, of clubs. And uh, there is a striker in Dei Mulamba who, when you even listen to the Congolese players at the time, they said, where did this guy come from? He ends up scoring nine goals in this tournament. And to this day, that's never really been matched. It's the single greatest scoring performance at an Africa Cup of Nations. And he propels Zaire to their second uh, AFCON uh, victory. Again, they go back home. They're promised... You know, the, they all get the order of the merit again. They're given uh, their paid vacation in another country, houses, cars, everything. And, and Mobutu really shows his appreciation for this national team. But they're drawn into a group with Scotland, Yugoslavia, and Brazil, which is a very tough group in the 1974 FIFA World Cup. There were actually Scottish scouts at the AFCON in Egypt that scouted Zaire. And they said, you know, this is quite arrogant, but they said, we should be able to beat this team 10-0 if we play the way we want to. Now, there's a lot that's been said about the 1974 uh, FIFA World Cup participation of Zaire. But what you have, let's take the, let's let's do an honest assessment of what really happened. Their performances at the AFCON were not spectacular. They were largely propelled by Mulamba's goal scoring. They lose all of the pre-World Cup friendlies that they participate in. All of them. The, the Scottish scouts are not impressed with them. And they're drawn into this tough group. Scotland wins 2-0. Okay, instead of 10-0. No. 
so they might have been disappointed with that. After the Scotland game, you have the match against Yugoslavia. Um, there's a lot of different things that, are, that have been said about this match. It finishes 9-0. It's the worst defeat in a FIFA World Cup in, in FIFA World Cup history. Some Zairean sources will say that prior to the match, the players learned that FIFA were given $600,000 to each federation as player bonuses and as team bonuses, and that the bonuses that they were promised by the Mobutu administration did not necessarily meet up to those bonuses that FIFA were promising players. And so they were very disappointed, angry, and we have the first uh, bonus player row from an African national team at, an Afri at a FIFA World Cup, which, as you know, has become a, a, a big plague in the decades that follow. So the players are not happy. They have an internal meeting at the team hotel. They say, we want more money. The government officials that traveled with the team were not happy with the players. They tell Mobutu this. Now, this is all supposed. Mobutu s sends back a message that they had better not boycott and that they had better play the match. Some players say that families were threatened, but that the players were still not happy. And you have this match against Yugoslavia, 9-0. And according to some Zairean sources, the goalkeeper Kazadi, who is actually one of the better goalkeepers in African football at the time, he decides to let in three goals very quickly as a, as a form of protest. Um, he's subbed off after the third goal. They still concede six more. But basically what Zairean players at the time were saying was that the team morale was so low that they basically weren't trying I'm not 100% convinced, to be honest. I, I do believe that there were maybe problems with bonuses. I don't know if Mobutu went so far as to threaten families. Perhaps he did. I wouldn't put it past him. Um, but I do think that that Zairean national team were not the best coached by Blagoj Vidinic. And I don't think they were the most talented either. I do think that even if team morale was higher they probably would have lost by a heavy scoreline to Yugoslavia, Brazil, and Scotland. Um, and there's that last match against Brazil where they lose 3-0, but there's one of the most famous scenes ever at a FIFA World Cup where um, Brazil wins a free kick inside of the Zaire half. It's an indirect free kick. The referee blows the whistle, and a Zaire player breaks the ranks from the wall that they were forming and kicks the ball, um, and he's booked. And... European media saw that as a chance to say, ah, look at these Africans. They don't know how to play football. They don't even know the rules. Um, and, you know, different podcasts and articles have been written. And the player says that, you know, Mobutu officials threatened his family. And that was his way of protesting. Again, I'm not convinced. I think that he just had a mental fart, a brain fart, you know, a mental lapse. And, and he just did it. I haven't seen any, like, real legitimate sources um, that say that, you know, uh, I mean, especially when you, re you have to listen to all the different testimonies. If, if all the players were unanimous in saying that this is what happened, I, I would agree. But when you listen to the player interviews, they start complaining about the coaching. They start complaining about the conditions that they were in and so on and so forth. And so I'm not 100% convinced of that side of the story. I do think that Zaire were ill-prepared. I do think that they were a talented team in Africa, one of the best, but they weren't probably the best African team at the time. And that their performances... Uh, really didn't live up to par. And when they got home, there was no fanfare this time. Uh, there are, again, some stories that, you know, Mobutu called up the players and he lambasted them and berated them for, for, times, for a long period of time about humiliating the nation. And that also really, just like May 20th, 1966, was a turning point for Mobutu to invest in football. The FIFA World Cup performance was a turning point for Mobutu to divest from football because immediately after we don't see Zaire uh, at an AFCON or a World Cup until 1988 where they qualify for the for the AFCON. So um, it's interesting because the main trend between Nasser and Kruma and Mobutu is that when the governments invest and and really make it a priority, they do well, and when they divest, it really suffers. So you see a real link between government investment and and the success of national teams. And just the last thing I'll say is that uh, a few months after that, we see Mobutu again swift uh, shift and turn for <laughs> swift. I can't believe this is happening to me. You see Mobutu shift 
and switch his focus, there we go, to uh, the Rumble in the Jungle. Um, Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman takes place in Kinshasa. And uh, this is like another mega event that Mobutu organizes to sort of legitimize his government. Mubu uh, Ali obviously wins a spectacular uh, fight, one of the greatest ever in boxing history. Um, and, you know, there's con pre-event concerts with like James Brown is invited. Um, Miriam Makiba, I believe, is invited as well. And so Mobutu still had this appetite for these mega events. But as the for the next decade or so, Mobutu continues to accrue wealth. He's known as like one of the richest uh, authoritarians of all time. Um, there's his administration is characterized by rampant uh, corruption, and uh, this national team really, really suffers. And it's not until he's deposed that Zaire, which later returns to DR Congo but keeps the name the Leopards, uh, continues to perform at Africa Cup of Nations tournaments. Yeah, so that's the uh, end of our story with Mobutu and, and, and football. If you enjoyed this, please don't hesitate to subscribe. Please don't hesitate to share. We're halfway through our African five-a-side team of match day one, which is African heads of state and their relationship with football. I don't know if you can hear this, but Friday prayers are starting over here in Algeria. So I'm going to have to uh, finish now and uh, we'll see you after the weekend with an African football roundup, recapping the happenings of African football over the weekend. All right. Thanks for listening. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Take care and we'll speak soon. Peace.